Ready? Yep, we're all set. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Virtual Abilities 2023 Mental Health Symposium. My name is Serenity Harold, and I have an autoimmune disease called mixed connective tissue disease that affects my body's ability to function. I have been bedridden for more than a decade. I am the CFO of My Adventuredom LLC. Our business goal is to fully fund no cost clinics across the US and Canada. Our website is myadventuredom.com if you'd like to learn more about it. Today, I would like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Vest and Dr. Rachel Hoopsick. Dr. Vest's research focuses on military populations and understanding the complex factors that impact their healthcare utilization and overall well being. Dr. Hoopsick's work focuses on understanding risk and resilience for problems and substance use and mental health amongst the military population. Their talk is titled Military Identity and Service Expectations Among Reservists, Associations with Mental Health and Substance Use. Please hold all questions and comments until the end of the presentation. Welcome Dr. Vest and Dr. Hoopsick. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for attending our presentation today. Uh, my name is Rachel Hoopsick and uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I'm Bonnie Vest. I am an associate research professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Buffalo. And we're really excited to be here today to tell you about some of the research we've been collaborating on, which focuses on military identity and service expectations among reservists and how these might relate to mental health and substance use in this population. So we wanted to give you a little overview of where we'll be taking you today. So uh, first we'll start with a bit of background on military reservists and we'll tell you more specifically about the Operation Safety Research Project that we've been collaborating on together. And then next we'll talk about two different but related and intersecting lines of research coming from this study, uh, both of which have to do broadly with how military members think about their military service and what they expect it to be like and how that may relate to their well-being and health. Uh, first, we'll explore service members' negative emotions related to never being deployed, followed by a discussion of uh, military and reserve identities and how these concepts relate to mental health and substance use in this population. And then lastly, we'll talk about the intersection of these two concepts and end with some final thoughts. Okay, so first, for those of you who may not be familiar, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background on the reserve forces in the United States and how this differs from the active duty military. So you can see in this chart, um, the green bars represent the reserve military forces, and they make up a significant proportion of the U.S. military. So we're talking about about 800,000 individuals out of the total 2.3 million who are serving currently. Um, and so the reserve branches include the Army National Guard, the Air National Guard, and then the reserves of the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines. Um, yeah, that covers it. Um, and so generally speaking, these members who are serving on reserve duty are engaging in um, an initial basic training once they enlist or join the military. And then after that, they're engaging in training about once a month on the weekend. Um, and then for a longer period of about two weeks during the year, but at any point they can be called to active duty and deployed overseas. Um, and since 9-11, this has happened at about the same rate as it does for active duty. Um, and so a few, few key differences to highlight between active duty and reserve military that you know, pertain to some of the issues we're gonna be exploring today. Um, as I think most people are familiar, the active duty military are serving full time as sort of their primary or only employment. Um, members in the active duty military have limited choice over where they're stationed and they can be moved across the US or abroad multiple times during their military service. Um, and while serving active duty members receive free medical care from the military health system. For individuals who are in the reserves, service is usually a part-time obligation, 
So members are often maintaining a full-time civilian career or maybe students enrolled in higher education. Um, reserve members usually remain in their hometown and are assigned to a nearby unit for that monthly training. Um, importantly, reserve members also are only eligible to receive medical benefits when they are activated or deployed. Um, and those who never deploy are not eligible for services at the VA after they finish their military service. Um, and so, as mentioned, both the reserves and the active duty can be deployed overseas on combat operations. The National Guard in particular, which is a significant portion of the folks that we'll be speaking about today, um, can also be activated stateside by the state governors for things like natural disasters and civil unrest, which we saw, I think, during the pandemic. We saw a lot of National Guard who were activated for those functions. The work that we're going to present today comes from an ongoing longitudinal study of reserve and National Guard soldiers as well as their spouses. And this project is called Operation Safety, and that acronym stands for Soldiers and Families Excelling Through the Years. So this project is funded by the uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health under the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the principal investigator is Dr. Gregory Homish at the University at Buffalo. So this study cohort consists of 418 couples or a total of 836 participants who have been participating in annual surveys on this project over several years, um, some of whom have completed a total of six surveys to date. So our sample was initially recruited between 2014 and 2015 uh, from multiple reserve and National Guard units across New York State in the United States. Uh, to be eligible for this study, participants needed to be married or cohabitating or living as married at baseline, speak and understand the English language, one member of the couple needed to be a current U.S. Army Reserve or National Guard soldier at, at enrollment at baseline, the soldier needed to be between the ages of 18 and 45, and the partner needed to be at least 18 years old. Additionally, uh, both members of the couple needed to have had at least one drink of alcohol in the past year, and both needed to be willing and able to participate. Uh, after initial eligibility, uh, all of our participants have been encouraged to remain in this longitudinal study, even if their circumstances have changed, like they left the military or perhaps separated from their partner. So now that we've told you a little bit about the overall parent study operation safety, next I want to go into a specific set of analyses that we've conducted and published related to the negative emotions that some soldiers experience as a result of never having been deployed, which we call non-deployment emotions. So we know uh, that military connected populations tend to be incredibly resilient, but we do know that compared to the general population, that these folks are sometimes at increased risk for poor health outcomes, including uh, sometimes problems with substance use, sometimes problems with mental illness. And we know that combat exposure is a well-established risk factor for uh, health problems and other substance use as well as a wide range of uh, mental health symptomatology. Although the overwhelming majority of military research regarding substance use and mental health focuses on the context of deployment, uh, many reservists, uh, those that we're talking about today, so these part-time service members, many of them never deploy during their military careers. And so, Despite most military research and interventions focusing on those who have experienced combat deployment, uh, there's some limited evidence that suggests that there may not be uh, many differences between those who have never been deployed and those who have been previously deployed in terms of substance use, uh, rates of substance use disorders, and suicidal ideation. Uh, however, I want to highlight that there's some emerging or growing literature that's pointing to an even greater risk among service members who have never been deployed uh, for depression as well as death by suicide. 
So deployment uh, in and of itself, uh, just whether or not a service member has been deployed is a poor predictor uh, of whether that person will experience problems with substance use or mental health. Uh, however, uh, never being deployed also has some special implications when it comes to the healthcare uh, of this population. So as Bonnie mentioned previously, um, there are some restrictions around uh, eligibility for uh, healthcare services through the VA. Uh, but we also know that never deployed reservists are less likely to be screened for alcohol use uh, than their previously deployed counterparts. And they're also less likely to seek mental health services when they need it. Uh, and they're more likely to report having barriers to accessing these services. So again, um, current federal policy in the U.S. prevents most never deployed reservists from receiving uh, VA healthcare benefits when they separate from the military. And so this leaves uh, civilian healthcare providers as being the only option for these folks. Uh, but these types of providers might lack military cultural competency. So given uh, the research that we've talked about so far today, uh, we now know that never deployed and previously deployed soldiers are both at significant risk for problems with substance use and mental health. And while the effects of combat exposure on these outcomes has been well examined among soldiers who have been deployed, uh, it was really less clear why service members who have never been deployed also seem to have many of these same problems. Uh, we actually had uh, multiple recruiting events for the larger parent project, Operation Safety, uh, canceled due to uh, suicide deaths among never deployed soldiers within those units. And so we began exploring this idea of non-deployment emotions. Uh, based on um, some feedback that we got from some of our soldier participants, as well as our prior research in other populations, we thought that perhaps some of these never deployed soldiers might be experiencing some feelings that are akin to a survivor's guilt or perhaps um, experiencing some type of so social separation uh, from their unit members. Uh, so it's important to point out, uh, similarly as Bonnie did earlier, that um, you know, while reservists who do deploy uh, might spend a year or more uh, with their unit, those who never deploy really only spend a few days of training and monthly weekend drills with their unit each year. Uh, so there might be a social component to this as well. So we ended up developing a novel measure of what we call non-deployment emotions. Uh, the non-deployment emotions questionnaire is a four item measure that assesses soldiers uh, guilt for never having been deployed as well as feeling that they are less valuable, have less camaraderie, and feel less connected with their unit for never having been deployed. And responses on this questionnaire could range from not at all to extremely. And uh, when we tested this measure, it showed good internal consistency with our sample of never deployed soldiers. So after developing uh, this measure of non-deployment emotions, we wanted to understand if these emotions might partially explain why never deployed service members also experience problems with mental health. So we first examined the cross-sectional relationships between uh, non-deployment emotions and a range of mental health indicators. And what we found was that the worse a soldier felt about never having been deployed, the worse their anger, anxiety, depression, and PTSD symptoms were. So following this study, we thought it might also be possible that non-deployment emotions might also partially explain why never deployed service members also experience problems with alcohol. We similarly examined the relationship between non-deployment emotions and several measures of alcohol use behaviors and outcomes among this sample of never deployed reservists. And we found that worse non-deployment emotions were associated with the frequency of getting drunk and the typical number of drinks that a soldier would consume during a typical drinking episode. And we found this for both men and women. But interestingly, we found that 
the worse a soldier's non-deployment emotions were, uh, this was only associated with the likelihood of having clinically significant alcohol problems among our sample of male soldiers, uh, but not among the female soldiers. We thought uh, it might then follow uh, that negative emotions regarding never having been deployed would also be associated with other types of substance use and perhaps persist over time. So we looked at several years of our data uh, with this longitudinal cohort, and we found that the more, uh, more negative non-deployment emotions were longitudinally associated with a greater likelihood of non-medical use of prescription drugs uh, so meaning misusing prescription drugs that are not prescribed to you or using them in greater amounts uh, more frequently or for a reason other than is prescribed. Uh, but again, we interestingly found this only for a uh, never deployed male soldiers. Okay. And so we're going to shift topics a little bit now and talk about some findings around identity, which relate to some of the things that Rachel was just talking about in terms of why is this phenomenon or this experience of not deploying causing such negative emotions and feelings among certain individuals. And some of this may be um, due to how identity is constructed in the military. Um, and so just a little bit of background on the scholarship on military and reserve identities. Um, speaking broadly, if we think of sort of what is a soldier or what does it mean to be a military service member, the sort of basic assumptions that we all hold culturally are that this is sort of a, an ideal masculine um, role. So we're thinking of like an ideal image of a combat soldier who exemplifies these traits of stoicism, emotional restraint, um, physical mastery. And so, you know, very, this, this is sort of the ideal image of what a soldier might be. And so this process of basic training and, you know, ongoing training and involvement in the military is supposed to ideally result in a complete replacement of that individual's sense of self. So you join the military and you go through this process of basic training where they strip away all of the things about who you were before you joined the military and rebuild you into this uh, ideal soldier where you become part of this group identity of belonging to the military. Um, and Yael Ben-Ari, who's an Israeli anthropologist, has done a lot of work that sort of looks at military identities almost as a hierarchy, where at the top you have that male combat soldier, and then there are all these different variations on that um, that, that come under it from other individuals who are serving in the military um, that have different characteristics, so are, are not, do not identify as male or are not serving in combat positions or may be ethnic or racially, ethnically or racially or culturally different from the majority of the people they are serving with. So there's really a lot of variation there, but the ideal and sort of the institutional goal is to create this homogenous identity. Um, within this, the case of the reserves are sort of an interesting case because reserve identities are always sort of somewhat hybrid based on the the nature of their military participation that we talked about and this sort of being part-time. Um, and so it's never totalizing in that same way because the individual is always maintaining an identity outside of their military service, whether it's, you know, their, their, um, their occupational identity or being a student or their role in their local family or community. Um, and so these have been conceptualized in different ways over time. Um, James Griffith has looked a lot at reserve identity in the United States and sort of what it means to be a citizen soldier throughout history. Um, and he talks about the ways in which this identity is very socially determined. Um, and so an individual maintains both a civilian and a military role and identity and sort of which one takes prominence at any given time might vary based on the social and environmental context that they're in. Um, 
some other Israeli anthropologists have also done a lot of work on this because so many of the so much of the population in Israel serve in the reserves. Um, and they've talked about reserve soldiers as being trans migrants um, and thinking about them as sort of these this group of people who travel and or transition daily between military and civilian cultures, identities and roles and kind of live in those two worlds at the same time. Um, in my own work with National Guard soldiers in the United States in the post 9-11 period, um, I did a lot of interviews with individuals asking them about their experiences in the National Guard and how they sort of thought of their identity um, as, as National Guard soldiers, particularly during that no, post 9-11 context with the high level of deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, Many of the people that I spoke to talked about this feeling that they were living a double life, um, that they were one person during the week when they were in their civilian job, and they were someone else when they were at their military training. Um, and for those who had never deployed, that soldier or military piece of their identity was, was sort of described as just one part of who they were, and it wasn't necessarily the most salient part of their identity. Um, but there seems to be a, a little shift around the experience of deployment um, in how individuals think of their, their identity. And so once someone had deployed, those who had deployed talked about this soldier identity becoming much more central to their sense of self and, and who they um, see themselves as. And part of this is because they have sort of achieved that ideal of participating in combat um, and fulfilling that full military role. Um, and so based on that work, as well as, um, you know, some of the other work that we've done in the past, we have developed a conceptual framework that pulls together our thinking on all of this. And I'm not going to go through this whole figure, but just to show you that, um, you know, we're looking at sort of a socio-ecological model, so factors at many different levels that influence individual outcomes. So individual factors, community factors, society factors. And then when we think about the reserves specifically, we're thinking about this idea of these two overlapping and intersecting domains of the military domain and the civilian domain. Um, and how there are levels of influence within each one and individuals transition between and across these domains and levels um, and also reflects that sort of continuum of identity from being a civilian to being a soldier and thinking about how individuals sort of move along that continuum throughout their their day to day or, or over the course of their lives. And so we really wanted to think a little bit about what all this has to do with health. Um, and we find that this is not something that's been thoroughly examined in the military context. Um, the emphasis has been much more, as Rachel mentioned, on combat exposure, trauma, um, and some of those factors. But we do know that identity can have a profound impact on health and on health behaviors. Um, there is some research coming out now that suggests that just the sort of potential for conflict between a military and a civilian identity may contribute in and of itself to a mental health challenge for an individual because they may see these two different identities as sort of in conflict or warring with each other and being opposed to each other. And so trying to reconcile that may be difficult. Um, the characteristics of military identity that I mentioned also relate directly to help seeking behaviors and well being. Um, and so it's pretty well documented in the literature that veterans are not are less likely to seek help for mental health challenges um, and also to downplay physical health problems. And this is because it's sort of conflicts or is in contrast to that ideal image of being strong and resilient and self sufficient. Um, and so, you know, one of the points I do want to make, though, is that it, this identity is not necessarily a negative identity, and we don't want to think about it that way, um, that this is an identity that's causing problems necessarily, because the vast majority of service members do very well with these things. Um, 
and are very resilient. But it's something just to keep in mind that, you know, we think about identity and the role that it's playing. And for some individuals, um, it may contribute to, um, to some challenges for them. And so we wanted to look at this in the data from that operation safety study that we've been talking about and see how military identity might relate to health outcomes for um, reserve and National Guard soldiers. And so we looked at a measure of identity centrality, um, which assessed sort of how central or how important having served in the military is to someone's sense of who they are. Um, and then how that related to a wide range of outcomes, including alcohol problems, um, non-medical prescription drug use, illicit drug use, tobacco use, and then anger, anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And then we controlled for a range of other factors that might be related to both substance use risk and also um, uh, identity. And so what we found is that military identity or this stronger sense of you know, being in the military, being central to who a person thinks, how a person thinks of themselves, was related to um, a greater risk of non-medical use of prescription drugs, as well as greater symptoms of all of the mental health outcomes that we assessed. So anxiety, depression, anger, and PTSD. Um, and this remained true um, after we controlled for some of those other factors like deployment, um, gender, and whether someone was still serving or had left the military. Um, it's also interesting, if you are familiar with military culture at all, alcohol is very prominent in military culture. Um, and so it's interesting to note that the identity did not relate to alcohol use in, this, in these particular analyses. Um, and so it's clear that identity relates to mental health and substance use in, in some complicated ways. Um, you know, we, it may be that some with who have a stronger military identity might find it harder to reintegrate um, into civilian life and to reconcile sort of those different roles or conceptions of themselves. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we did not find any relationships with alcohol, despite it sort of being very prevalent and common within the military. Um, but we did find a relationship between military identity and non-medical prescription drug use. Um, and this may be an indication, we think, uh, potentially of avoiding help seeking and attempting to sort of self-medicate for either physical or mental health um, challenges. And so, you know, thinking about how this contributes to health behaviors and outcomes is, is not simple. Um, these are obviously complicated, and this was just sort of a first dip of our toe into this water to try to see if we could understand a little bit of what's going on here. Um, and I think it's important to note that that military identity and some of those traits that we talked about are highly adaptive in military and combat settings. So we don't want to remove those characteristics or traits. That's not the solution here. Um, and so instead, it's thinking about how can we support individuals through that shift or transition once they're no longer in that military setting or context, whether it's for good because they've left the military or in the case of reserves, whether it's you know because they're just in their civilian role currently. Um, and for those who are having a struggle related to this, how can we incorporate a consideration of identity into treatments or interventions or programs to help individuals um, get past those challenges that they're experiencing. Okay, so next we're, we're gonna try and connect these two pieces for you. So uh, we've, we previously established uh, that those negative uh, emotions for never having been deployed, or we called them non-deployment emotions, uh, was associated with the risk of substance use among uh, our sample of reservists. However, the mechanisms by which non-deployment emotions affect this risk uh, really have not been explored. Uh, so we thought it might be possible uh, that never being deployed might be what is conflicting with uh, some service member's military identity, which might then uh, explain the relation between non-deployment emotions and substance use, particularly uh, among men. 
So we wanted to understand uh, the intersection of these concepts by examining if perhaps there is a differential effect of non-deployment emotions on substance use uh, by soldiers' uh, military identity. So we examined a subset of cross-sectional data from Operation Safety uh, to look at the moderating effects of veteran identity centrality. Uh, so as Bonnie highlighted, that's really your sense of, um, you know, serving in the military as being central to who you are. Uh, how that um, how that might affect the the established relations between non-deployment emotions and substance use outcomes among uh, both male and female soldiers separately. And we found uh, that among male reservists, veteran identity centrality uh, significantly moderated the effect of non-deployment emotions on alcohol problems, uh, or in other words, uh, male soldiers who had highly negative non-deployment emotions or felt really terrible about never having been deployed and who also had a very high veteran uh, identity centrality or serving in the military was very important to their sense of self, uh, those folks, that subset had an elevated risk of problematic alcohol use. Uh, but again, we had this finding for male soldiers, but not for female soldiers. And so these findings uh, begin to suggest that never being deployed uh, might conflict with some uh, service members' military identity, particularly men, uh, and manifest in problematic alcohol use. And so just to wrap up in conclusion, um, understanding how military identity and then service expectations, particularly around deployment and participation in those activities, um, contribute to mental health and substance use is an important but under-examined piece um, that is really needed to improve outcomes for Reserve and National Guard soldiers. And um, as we've talked about today, our work suggests that both strong military identity and then the negative emotions that arise from unmet expectations around military service may increase the risk of um, negative outcomes for some individuals. And so thinking about ways that we can help address uh, these feelings and expectations alongside treatments for substance use and mental health concerns is an important next step for the field to sort of add consideration of these factors into the picture. Um, and so I think that's all we have today. We want to thank you for attending the presentation. Our contact information is listed here if you'd like to get in touch with us. Um, or you can also visit the link to learn more about the overall project. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions there might be. Okay, we have a question from Shiloh. She said, they asked, in your research, uh, what trends were revealed between different different ethnic groups and their attitudes about joining the military deployment versus non-deployment? Uh, special emphasis of Native, Native Americans or First Nations people. Uh, years back, a customer asked me about why so many Native American men had or might join the military. I responded that logically, this behavior might have to do with the way indigenous men may view military roles as one of the last ways they are able to establish a concept of quote-unquote male gender identity since tribal hunting, uh, hunter and community protection may not be accessible today, on contrast to the historical tribal so social definitions and perception of quote-unquote manhood. Uh, what are your interpretations of the social situation? That's a really great question. Um, I don't, we don't have any, um, I don't have to hand data on those aspects specifically. Unfortunately, that's not something we've been able to explore specifically um, in the work that we've done so far, but I do think it's a really important consideration. Um, and I know 
like I mentioned previously, some of the work from the Israeli anthropologists, they've done some really interesting work um, looking at sort of the ethnic and minor religious minority groups in Israel who serve in the Isra Israeli military. Um, and similar sort of thoughts have arisen there that this is a way for them to sort of claim citizenship and, you know, fill that masculine role um, and feel that they are sort of meeting those expectations um, within their their own cultures. So I, I, um, I think it's really interesting and definitely something that we need to explore further. I don't know if you have anything to add, Rachel. Yeah, I was just going to add, you know, given our sample size, uh, our sample is fairly diverse, but we couldn't, you know, particularly isolate, um, you know, indigenous populations within our sample to have a large enough number to look at these same types of topics uh, within that sample. Um, but I did just want to call out, we do have a doctoral student, uh, Skylar Lawson, working uh, on the Operation Safety Project, um, who's been uh, leading an analysis uh, using a different data set, so not coming from Operation Safety, but actually looking at some national data uh, coming from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, and he had looked at um, racial and ethnic disparities in uh, both substance use disorder outcomes as well as serious psychological distress among veterans um, and did find that there are uh, lots of uh, variations in these outcomes according to race and ethnicity. So while it, it doesn't directly, um, I think, get at this specific question with indigenous populations, I think um, it highlights the importance of this question that, it, you know, these experiences are not uh, universal. And so we need to think about um, having these intersectional identities um, and certainly race and ethnicity um, are parts of your identity, but also uh, military service is a part of that identity. So again, uh, playing up the importance of identity in mental health and substance use related outcomes. Okay, Muka has a comment. Uh, there are undoubtedly several, several sources of stress, including uh, one, the difference between the male and female data indicates that it is only the uh, masculine ideal for the men, but not the women, under constant tension, threat, and conflict. Uh, is this a something has to give scenario or, or a losing face situation? And two, living a double life. Uh, the US civilian and military societies are directly opposing worlds. The former sees individuality, freedom, freedom of choice, and peace as the natural state. Uh, the latter expects obedience, rigid structure, hierarchy, and a pre-war footing to be the status quo. How can one reconcile such an enforced split identity situation? Uh, this absolutely risks disorder. And three, lastly, living as a lifelong, never deployed soldier suggests living in a chronic flight or fight state, both physiologically and psychologically, but uh, it is a state without any end in sight. And Gentle says, thank you both. This was very interesting. Question, can you offer some suggestions to civilian parents, spouses, siblings, friends, or uh, reservists to help them deal with the disparity between their anticipated and their actual services? Okay. Where, where should we start? Um, <laughs> I think I can start with this, um, the question about this sort of U U.S. civilian and military societies being very um, distinct and having sort of opposite and contradictory values. Um, and, and I do think that is a, a challenge and something that scholars in like sociology and political science have been looking at for a long time, sort of this gap between civilians in the United States and the military, especially because the military is such a small percentage of um, the U.S. population in this current uh, historical time frame. Um, and I do think it's a challenge. And I think, I guess this also gets a little to the question about how can we help 
civilian and family members of reservists um, to uh, sort of understand these these issues. I really think we need some some honest and open dialogue um, between the military and the civilian communities because a lot of times there's this sort of um, we hear a lot from the veterans we talk to, you know, that civilians don't understand them and they feel like they can only talk to other veterans because, um, you know, there's just not, they're not able to make that connection there. And I think trying to find a way to, you know, indicate and and offer um, an open, open uh, dialogue between, you know, both of these sort of worlds or cultures is going to, is really important for the individual soldiers well-being, but also for us as a, as a society to think about like how to bridge some of these, these differences and think about, um, you know, what, what they mean and how we, how we reconcile them, because I do think it is, it is challenging. Um, and I, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there, but I just think that that's one way forward is to have, open and honest communication and dialogue at a community level or a societal level um, about sort of what these things mean and what the challenges are. Yeah, I think I'll add on to what Bonnie is saying, you know, about these issues, um, particularly with masculinity. You know, when we think about uh, the U.S. military and the culture within the military, I think many of us can agree that there are um, issues surrounding hegemonic masculinity, uh, and perhaps we need to directly address those issues uh, when it comes to uh, service members who don't fit the sort of uh, stereotypical, uh, quote unquote, ideal of what it means to be uh, a service member. Um, you know, so addressing that uh, by normalizing perhaps non-deployment, first of all, you know, as it relates to the things that we've been talking about today, um, but also um, addressing issues within the military itself related to bullying and victimization of, again, folks who don't fit that, um, that trope of, of, of what it means to be a warrior soldier. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, just touch on briefly was um, part of the question was, um, or statement or comment rather was about living um, in this lifelong, never deployed soldier, having this chronic flight or flight state affecting people both physiologically and psychologically. Um, I think what we're hitting on here um, is this idea of um, anticipatory stress. Like in, in addition to uh, perhaps all of these issues surrounding military identity, which we've talked about today, now we also have issues of um, really anticipatory anxiety about really just not knowing what is coming next. Um, and so that's a whole other field of research around anticipatory anxiety. Um, but some of it suggests that, you know, when we are um, experiencing dread or fear about some upcoming event that we haven't experienced for yet, um, that we don't have full information for, that sometimes the effects of that anticipatory stress or anticipatory anxiety is even worse than experiencing the actual event itself. Um, and so in addition to all of these issues around identity um, for never having been deployed, we also have now perhaps folks who are still serving in the military um, who are anticipating being deployed and not knowing when that might happen and what that might be like for them and for their families. Um, and so that certainly I think goes into uh, that comment related to living in a constant state of, of, of fight or flight.
Polaris has a question. Have you looked at technology? I'm not sure exactly um, what you're referring to with tech, um, but I'll just clarify that Bonnie is an anthropologist by training and I'm an epidemiologist by training. So neither of us uh, do a lot of intervention type work, but uh, the, the VA um, healthcare administration in the US um, has been, I think an early adopter of using tech to treat uh, mental and physical health problems. Um, I think most interestingly lately, there's been a lot of research coming out of the VA uh, and university collaborators with the use of virtual reality um, as a therapy for PTSD, as well as for pain and other conditions. So um, it's sort of an, an emerging area of research, but not one that uh, Bonnie or I uh, engage in directly. And that's interesting. I, I hadn't coordinated with Polaris, but I had a question. There are military groups in Second Life. Would you be interested in talking with them as part of your research? Because I'm wondering, what does the otherness of a virtual world add into this equation of which you've been building of causes and effects? We're always interested in making connections with other folks who, who have an interest in this field as well. Yeah, and I, I do think that's really interesting. I, I know, I remember reading something, I think years ago, they were actually using Second Life um, in treatment for PTSD, I believe, as sort of a form of exposure therapy, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and so I, I do think, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to explore in that in that realm with technology and virtual worlds and, and realities and how that sort of um, what role that can play for people. Yeah, that's Skip Rizzo out of the University of California. Okay. Versus um, point or Polari mentions uh, there.com uh, as another VR platform. That's where they came from. And I think we can wrap this up. Oh, 2004. Interesting. Right. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank thank you. you so much for your time. Uh, I think we do have a handout in the box up front. Um, it just has a list of uh, some of the publications that we talked through uh, today, as well as a link to the Operation Safety Research Project if you wanted to learn more about that. Thank you both. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.